Well, uh, thank you. Uh, that was really such a kind and very generous introduction. Uh, it's really an honor, a, a, an actual thrill to be here uh, because there is indeed so much happening with AI. Um, and so what I wanted to do today is to really uh, have some time with all of you. Um, I, I think possibly the most important audience uh, that I'm facing for the year to talk about, first off, uh, what would the impact, both positive and negative, of AI today and in the future be with everything that's going on. But before doing that, the most important thing is to actually just come to grips with uh, what the heck is this AI stuff anyway? <laughs> and that is actually uh, something that is not just a funny question, um, but it can be life or death because a lack of understanding of this new tool in a healthcare setting, in a medical setting, uh, can be exceptionally dangerous. And so as I've uh, been uh, conducting this research and going around uh, trying to explain to people, uh, trying to help the world of healthcare get up to speed and take assertive control of the question of whether, when, and how AI should be integrated into the delivery of healthcare and into the advancement of medical science, uh, I've come to a specific way of trying to give some intuitions as to what this new tool is. This new tool for which we still don't have a user manual. And so to do that, uh, I'm going to ask a question, and it'll feel silly, uh, but please bear with me. How many of you in this audience have read this book, Charlotte's Web by E.B. White? Okay. And there's quite a few hands. Um, I understand that if you grew up, in, let's say, in the United Kingdom or in uh, some part of China or Brazil uh, in Japan, uh, you might not have read this, but if you were uh, raised in the United States, uh, it's very likely that you have read this book. Uh, it's it's uh, truly a classic. And so let's imagine that I don't believe you. And so I'm going to ask you some quiz questions. Uh, to allow you to prove to me that you're not lying, that you have actually read this book. And so the first question I'm going to ask is, uh, can you please describe one of the main characters of the book? Now, um, this audience is too big, so please don't uh, offer to answer. Um, <laughs> but I'm guessing uh, that most of you who have read this book can, in fact, give me an intelligent answer to that question. And while that seems trivial, it actually isn't. Uh, just based on the rough ages of all of you in this audience, I'm guessing it's been many years since any of you have read that book, um, perhaps several decades even. <laughs> and yet, when you did read that book, or if it was read to you by a teacher or a parent, or maybe you read it to your own children while you were raising them, you distilled into the neural circuitry of your brain some facts about this book. And now, decades later, I can ask that question, and miraculously, that flesh inside your skull is able to resurrect that information and carry out an intelligent conversation with me. And if you take a step back and just think about what your brain is doing, it's, it's actually hard to believe that it, that can happen. And yet, we do it every day, all day. It's incredible. And so one of the first things about large language models, the technology of large language models that powers this idea of generative AI, is that generative AI systems have also read books like Charlotte's Web. And so we can ask a generative AI system the same question, please describe one of the main characters, and generative AI systems can give us a cogent answer. Now, somehow, that doesn't seem so impressive. We expect computers to have perfect memory recall. So no big deal. Certainly not as miraculous as what your human brain is doing. So let's try a harder question. What do you think this book tries to teach us about the value of friendship? Now again, I am certain that every single one of you who have read this book, and probably those of you who haven't even, could carry out an hour-long cogent, intelligent conversation with me on that question. And that is an amazing thing 
because there are no words in this book that give you the answer to that question. You have to read between the lines. You have to connect to human experience. You have to make connections and relationships to social context, maybe historical context. And again, you are able to do that even if it's been 30 years since you've opened this book. Just miraculous. And now in a modern miracle of technology, we now have AI technology that can also cope with such questions. And so to do that, I'm going to do something very risky and uh, actually carry out a conversation with a generative AI system. And for that, I'm going to use OpenAI's GPT-4 uh, generative AI system uh, on my mobile phone. I hope this works. Um, and um, uh, just so you know, uh, GPT-4 is available in different ways. You can use the OpenAI ChatGPT Plus application. Uh, you can use the Bing search engine um, and uh, ask for the chatbot there. Um, or if you're an enterprise customer, you can subscribe to the Azure, Microsoft Azure OpenAI service. Uh, for this, I'll just go ahead and use the OpenAI application. So let's see what we can do. Hi, GPT-4. Uh, have you read the book Charlotte's Web? And if so, can you describe one of the main characters? And please be very brief. Um, I'm giving a talk in front of a large audience. Hey, Peter. Yes, I'm familiar with Charlotte's Web. One of the main characters is Charlotte, a wise and caring spider. She lives in a barn and becomes a great friend to Wilbur the pig. Charlotte is known for spinning words into her web to save Wilbur's life. Good luck with your talk. Thank you. Um, what do you think this book tries to teach us about the value of friendship? Charlotte's Web beautifully illustrates the depth and impact of friendship. It shows that true friends support and uplift each other, often going to great lengths to help. In the story, Charlotte's selfless acts for Wilbur highlight loyalty and sacrifice, key elements of a strong friendship. It's a reminder that friendship can cross the most unexpected boundaries and that a true friend can come from anywhere. This story resonates because it mirrors the best qualities we seek in our own friendships. OK, I've just put uh, GPT-4 on pause so she can't hear us. Um, but um, the, um, um, it's an impressive answer. It's very impressive. But it's very important for us, particularly as scientists, to be skeptical. For sure, thousands, maybe even millions of school children in school have been given the assignment to read Charlotte's Web. Thousands of those probably have been given the essay prompt from their school teachers to write an essay exactly on that topic. And then hundreds, maybe thousands of those essays have been posted on the internet. And so surely GPT-4, during its training, just like it read Charlotte's Web, also have read those essays, those products of human thought and expression. And so if we are being truly careful and skeptical, we have to assume that all we are hearing there is a simple regurgitation of those products of human thought and expression. They can't possibly be original ideas generated by a machine, can they? And this is now one of the fundamental questions facing scientists today. And over the last few years, computer scientists have developed increasingly technical ways to do a type of brain surgery on the digital neural networks uh, that power these AI systems. Uh, and we've been slowly making our way into understanding the neural circuits that produce the functions, the cognitive functions that generate these ideas. Some of those are very sophisticated, but there are also some simple methods that we've developed. And one very simple method to explore this is to simply ask questions that have never been asked before and then assess the originality of the answers. And so, again, I have no idea what's going to happen here, but I'm going to ask a question that I've been holding in reserve just for this uh, presentation that I'm pretty sure has never been asked before. And let's see what GPT-4 does. Thanks. That's great. Do you see any connections between those lessons and the goals and mission of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement? Absolutely, Peter. <laughs> the Institute 
Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, focuses on improving health and healthcare worldwide, a mission requiring collaboration, empathy, and a commitment to making a difference. Values echoed in Charlotte's Web. The book's lessons about friendship, like selflessness and working together for a greater good, align well with IHI's goals. In healthcare, collaboration across various disciplines and a dedication to patient welfare are essential, much like how different characters in the book come together for a common cause. This similarity highlights the universal importance of cooperation and empathy in making impactful changes, whether in healthcare or in the broader narrative of life. Thanks, that's a pretty good friendships in Charlotte's Web offer a deeper perspective. This aspect can be related to the healthcare field, especially in terms of interdisciplinary collaboration and embracing diverse perspectives. In healthcare, professionals from various backgrounds, doctors, nurses, researchers, and technologists like those in AI, work together, much like how different species in the book unite for a common purpose. This diversity in collaboration crossing traditional boundaries is crucial for innovation and comprehensive care, mirroring the message in Charlotte's Web about the strength and value found in unlikely alliances and diverse perspectives. Just as Charlotte and Wilbur's unique friendship leads to extraordinary outcomes, so does the fusion of different expertise and viewpoints in healthcare lead to breakthroughs and improved patient outcomes. You'll have to forgive GPT-4 for being so verbose. Um, uh, but now, in fact, and we can keep pushing. Um, a, another question that comes to my mind is uh, the fact that in the book, Charlotte tragically dies. And, you know, what are the connections there? And as you probe deeper and deeper, your skepticism, and trust me, I was one of the most skeptical people uh, when GPT-4 emerged, uh, starts to get shaken. And as we move forward, of course, we still have the mystery of where these thoughts and ideas are coming from, where these words are coming from. Um, but the words themselves continually express original thoughts uh, and ideas. Now, I want to ask one more quiz question of you to prove to me that you've read the book Charlotte's Web. And here it is, last one. Please recite chapter one of the book word for word. Actually, in a crowd this size, there might be one person in here who can do that. Um, I haven't actually personally met such a person. Uh, they do exist. Um, but in fact, it's very rare. And it's rare because for as miraculous as the human brain is, uh, the human brain also has some significant limitations. And one of its limitations is in rote memorization. In fact, it takes exceptional energy and effort for the human brain to memorize long texts. Uh, there are other limitations that your brain has. For example, uh, you're very limited in the ability to do uh, large amounts of arithmetic or logical calculation in your head without the use of tools. Uh, for the most part, you're unable to do reliable arithmetic unless you have a tool like paper and pencil or a calculator. And oddly, generative AI systems have some analogous limitations. Let's try and see. GPT-4, can you please recite chapter one of the book word for word? I can't recite the entire first chapter of Charlotte's Web word for word as it's a copyrighted work, but I can certainly give you a summary or discuss key themes from the chapter. Would you like a brief summary of chapter one? Uh, no, thanks, and, and thank you for respecting copyright. But um, are you even capable of rote memorization of long texts? I don't have the capability for rote memorization like a human. My design doesn't store information or texts in a way that allows for exact word-for-word -word recall of long passages, such as entire chapters of books. I generate responses based on a mixture of licensed data data created by human trainers, and publicly available data. This approach helps me provide information and answer questions while respecting copyright laws. 
And so you see this weird situation. And in fact, in my encounters with leaders of healthcare organizations, of medical institutions, uh, with patient uh, uh, advocacy groups, the biggest thing I realize is that the mental model that the healthcare world has of a computer is that a computer is a machine that has perfect memory recall and does perfect calculation. And that is, in fact, the computer that we're all familiar with. And so if that's your mental model of a computer, the most important thing to understand about generative AI is it is not a computer. It is not a machine that does perfect calculation and is incapable of perfect memory recall. It's a reasoning engine. It's something that we think does some form of thinking. Um, Ethan Mollick, a professor of the Warden School at UPenn, uh, says it's best to think of a generative AI system as your personal intern. <laughs> and so what we all need to understand, and this audience in particular, I think carries one of the prime responsibilities for the world, is to carry that lesson forward. Because if you use a generative AI system under the assumption that it's a traditional computer, you can get into trouble, your patients can get into trouble. And so large language models, LLMs, are not like traditional computers. They behave more like eager, tireless, and faulty interns. All right, so now let's get into the question here of like medicine and healthcare. After all, that's what this uh, whole conference is about. And so uh, let's continue this conversation uh, a little bit, and then I'm gonna put this aside because I'm really stretching my luck. Uh, thanks, GPT-4. I'd like to change the subject. Uh, let's say I'm a doctor, and I would like you, uh, let's imagine that Fern Arable from the book Charlotte's Web is coming to me uh, with a problem. Uh, last week, she was kept home from school with a sore throat and upper respiratory infection, and now she has since had swelling in her legs and yesterday saw blood in her urine, uh, which hasn't recurred. Really stretching our luck here. The combination of a recent upper respiratory infection, followed by swelling in the legs and blood in the urine, could suggest a post infectious complication like post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. This condition often follows strep throat or a skin infection and can lead to kidney inflammation. The key steps would include one, a thorough physical examination, two, urine tests to check for blood, protein, and other signs of kidney involvement. Three, blood tests to evaluate kidney function and look for evidence of recent strep infection. Four, possibly an ultrasound of the kidneys, depending on findings. The goal would be to confirm the diagnosis and assess the severity, then guide treatment accordingly. In a real world scenario, referring her to a pediatric nephrologist, kidney specialist, might also be considered depending on the findings and severity. This hypothetical scenario emphasizes the importance of considering the whole clinical picture, including recent illnesses and current symptoms in making a diagnosis. Thanks. Um, I've just uh, finished the physical exam. Um, all the vitals are in normal range. I do see a mild cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, there is erythema of the posterior pharynx, and I see pitting edema to both knees at three plus. Um, I'll send out for some labs. GPT-4, did you hear me? Got it, Peter. The findings from the physical exam, normal vitals, mild cervical lymphadenopathy, erythema of the posterior pharynx, and three-plus pitting edema to both knees fit with the earlier suspicion of a post-infectious complication. The labs should include a complete blood count, renal function tests, a throat culture, and ASO titers to check for recent strep infection. A urinalysis and urine culture will help evaluate the kidney involvement. These tests will provide crucial information to narrow down the diagnosis and guide treatment. Keep in mind the importance of monitoring her kidney function 
and the potential need for a nephrology referral, depending on the lab results. Okay, the labs have come back. Um, everything looks normal except the serum concentration of C3 is abnormally low. So uh, doesn't that mean it's not PSGN, but uh, maybe an acute rheumatic fever? The low serum C3 level is an important clue. In post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, PSGN, you typically see low C3 levels, which usually return to normal in several weeks. This finding aligns with PSGN rather than acute rheumatic fever. Acute rheumatic fever, on the other hand, is usually associated with normal complement levels like C3 and C4. It primarily affects the heart, joints, skin, and nervous system, but not typically the kidneys. Given fern symptoms in the low C3, PSGN seems more likely. However, it's essential to continue monitoring her and possibly consult a nephrologist for further evaluation and management as kidney involvement needs careful attention. Uh, thanks, you're being very kind to me. Obviously, I made a big mistake. It's completely okay, Peter. Navigating through medical diagnoses, especially in complex cases, can be challenging. It's a process of piecing together various bits of information. And sometimes it takes a bit of back and forth to get to the right conclusion. Mistakes or initial misinterpretations are part of the learning and diagnostic process, even for experienced professionals. If you have any more questions or scenarios to discuss, feel free to share. All right, um, enough of that. Um, so as we get into that, um, there are a few things I wanted to point out. Uh, first off, uh, the GPT-4 in particular, but other large language models that are emerging as well, know a lot, a surprising amount about medicine. Um, we first wrote about this in, in this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, but there have been numerous studies, dozens of studies over the past year since then. Uh, two uh, that I'd like to highlight out of Microsoft Research uh, on medical knowledge tests um, uh, show that on medical knowledge tasks uh, that roughly uh, speaking, GPT-4 operates at about the 97th percentile of human clinicians, um, and that translates into about nine out of 10 questions being answered correctly. Um, and this is not just Microsoft research, uh, and it's not just medical challenge problems of the sort that you might find in, say, the U.S. Medical Licensing Exam or in the NCLEX uh, uh, exam for nursing, um, but uh, in curbside consults, the types of questions that clinicians might ask each other, um, uh, or in the kinds of uh, clinical puzzles or problem solvings that you might see in major journals, like the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and indeed, GPT-4 in particular is very interesting. I'm not trying to sell it, but it's very interesting because it hasn't been trained specifically for medicine. It hasn't been brought to medical school. And yet, it outperforms all other existing large language models, even those like MedPalm2 that have been trained specifically for medicine. And in our experimentation, we find that GPT-4 has an ability to bring ideas from multiple subspecialties in medicine, as well as other fields, like biology and chemistry, into a synthesis uh, of its results. But it's not just about uh, diagnosis. There's the everyday work of delivering healthcare, and some of the healthcare work, of course, is very technical. And so uh, this is a problem from the, that is typical from the NCLEX nursing uh, exam uh, that involves some calculation. Uh, and we find that GPT-4 is able to carry out this type of calculation. And since it's able to explain its reasoning steps, you can do more than just ask it this kind of question. You can say, ah, in the future, I would like an app for this. Can you please write the code? And GPT-4 will decide on its own, well, the best way to do that is to write a JavaScript web app. It will write the code and then give you instructions on how to load that on your mobile phone. 
Uh, and once you have that, then you uh, have an app for that task in the future. And so it's able to operate not only on the direct tasking that you've given it, but at the meta level to actually encode in computer code the workflows uh, in the delivery of healthcare. OpenAI's GPT-4 knows really a lot about healthcare and medicine, and we aren't completely certain as to how and why, uh, but it's fairly incredible. Um, having said that, if you listen to the conversation I had about Fern Arable, I made uh, a rookie mistake in doubting the diagnosis of PSGN and instead uh, dictating a diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever. And what you saw is that GPT-4 uh, was able to very politely disagree with me and point out my error. Um, and in fact, this is something that today, even though GPT-4 knows a lot, it does make mistakes, just like any human doctor would, just like any human nurse would. And so uh, my recommendation today is for the human doctor and nurse to do your own work, and then use GPT-4 or other large language models as a second set of eyes, as a reviewer, as a critic, as an evaluator of your work. And as you saw in that conversation, uh, in that mode, it's my accountability as a doctor to make that final diagnosis of PSGN versus ARF, and then to have the aid, the augmentation of AI to point out the error uh, in my correlation of low C3 levels, low complement levels, uh, with ARF instead of PSGN. All right, so now let's continue. Um, of course, as techies, you know, we get fixated on what happens in the clinic, but there's so much more to the business of healthcare that impinges on the quality of what's delivered. Uh, one thing is just the very human thing about how to talk to patients. And in fact, in our research over the past year and a half, this is an area that we find clinicians consistently gravitate towards as they adopt generative AI. And this is another remarkable thing. In generative AI systems, we see cognitive abilities in causal reasoning, the ability to chain causes and effects, counterfactual reasoning, the ability to reason on the basis of what can't be true. But we also see something called theory of mind, the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes and imagine what they might be thinking and feeling. And we find that these gender AI systems have remarkable capability to project themselves uh, into someone else's shoes. And this ends up being something that is very useful in prompting clinicians to know how to talk to their patients. And I'll get back to this in a little bit, but it can be something that feels a little bit disturbing to get advice from a machine on how to talk to your patient. Uh, but the way I choose to think about this is that we are using a machine to cause us as human beings to take a step back and reflect on how to approach a conversation, a potentially difficult conversation with a potentially desperate patient. And that idea of reverse prompting, not only the human being prompting the AI, but the AI prompting the human being to just pause and think uh, ends up being one of the most powerful features of the integration of generative AI in medicine. Uh, incidentally, this is also something that has been studied. There are quite a few great papers. One paper that I uh, like was uh, one out of um, UC San Diego Medicine, Johns Hopkins, um, looking and studying the responses to patient queries that are uh, on healthcare that are posted to social media. Um, and they found, of course, that the AI was able to provide answers uh, correctly at about the same rate as human clinicians. Um, but by a factor of over nine to one, patients deemed the responses from the AI to be more empathetic. And it's not the case, of course, that a machine can be empathetic. Uh, but a machine has the tireless ability to just add those extra personal touches. And again, it's something that can really help a doctor just take a little bit of an extra pause. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on in the business of healthcare. Um, 
the clerical and administrative burden, of course, um, I know uh, just looking at the agenda for this conference is a huge topic. Um, and it is just a terrible burden that seems to just be relentlessly increasing year after year. And this is one area that we're seeing the emerging first products that are hitting the market try to address. Uh, using the summarization and generative capabilities uh, in order to generate text uh, that give a starting point, a first draft, uh, for things like justification text for a prior authorization request. Um, indeed, GPT-4 has been tested extensively now uh, at Microsoft and many other companies on its ability to listen to a doctor-patient conversation and write a clinical encounter note. And so here, uh, you know, I asked uh, GPT-4 to write, to imagine a clinical encounter between a doctor and Fern Arable uh, and write the note. And you'll see here, it even leaves the blanks for some things that weren't expressed verbally uh, in the encounter, um, for example, about various vital signs. And that idea now has reached the market. Um, there are several wonderful products on the market. Uh, let me just focus on uh, one from Microsoft, uh, which is Nuance uh, DAX Copilot. Um, and this is one of their marketing blurbs. I won't spend too much time on this. Um, but uh, the early kind of clinical studies on this uh, have been very promising. Um, and one number that I particularly resonate with in my own interactions with clinicians who have been the early adopters of this technology is that 97%, uh, that clinicians, once they adopt this, don't want to let go of it. Um, and that it just has a meaningful uh, improvement in the quality uh, and day-to-day -day satisfaction uh, of their working lives. Um, it's not just Microsoft, uh, with Epic, uh, Epic has been very, very active integrating generative AI uh, into their, uh, uh, their systems, into their EHR systems and applications. Uh, this is a slide uh, from Epic, um, just showing uh, notionally an integration into uh, their uh, inbox application. Um, and uh, here, just the ability to intelligently take from all the different parts of uh, of the clinician's history uh, through the various complexities of Epic's EHR system and then synth synthesize them into a first draft uh, of a note. Uh, what we find in the early clinical validations is about 30 to 40 percent of these uh, first draft notes uh, are actually sent after review uh, unchanged uh, and the others uh, of course, have led to a dramatic reduction in the amount of time uh, that clinicians have. And you'll note here uh, that in those clinical studies that patients are again receiving these notes uh, as being, quote unquote, more human than what they've been receiving before. Because they're just those extra little touches to just, in this case, you know, congratulate uh, this patient for becoming a grandparent. And those things that a very, very busy clinicians might struggle to just take that extra pause uh, and communicate uh, can make all the difference in the world. Uh, and of course, there's a clinical use of this also for the clinician just to receive, if there's a handoff, let's say, to another clinician, if there's a shift change uh, amongst nurses, um, if there is a referral to a specialist, to just get a concise summary and be able to ask questions, probing questions interactively, uh, the system uh, through an EHR uh, ends up being uh, extremely uh, useful. And to the credit of Epic, uh, they aren't just releasing this uh, wildly. They're going through with various academic medical centers uh, the controlled studies uh, to assess both the correctness of this but also uh, the productivity benefits. It goes even further. Uh, let's imagine for an arable, PSGN, uh, I'm the doctor, I'm interested, or maybe Fern's father, John, is interested in a clinical trial. Uh, I went to clinicaltrials.gov, did a search for PSGN, this is the first hit. It's a very complex uh, technical document. As a busy doctor, I might not have time to really read this. Um, as John Arable, Fern's father, I wouldn't be able to make heads or tails out of this. Uh, we can ask GPT-4 to read 
that document and ask the question, would Fern be a candidate for this clinical trial? And GPT-4 reads the document, concisely explains uh, the exclusion and inclusion criteria, and then gives an early opinion about the potential candidacy of Fern for this trial. And that idea now is being pursued uh, by a number of uh, new ventures. Uh, and in fact, within Microsoft Research, uh, we have been trialing an early clinical trial matching platform uh, based exactly on that type of, of uh, capability. I, uh, as Tejal had uh, explained, I, my regular job is uh, to lead the research division at Microsoft. And in that, um, I receive many, on a typical day, maybe half a dozen new drafts of research papers and abstracts from various uh, members of um, our laboratories. Uh, it's important for me to try to keep up to date with what's going on in our labs, but it's just overall, it's overwhelming. GPT-4 has been a godsend for me. And so with GPT-4, uh, here in this case, I went to uh, the search engine and looked for a research paper on PSGN. So this is the first one I could find. I downloaded it. Um, and what I do now is I open up that paper in my web, uh, Edge web browser. I'm not trying to push Edge. You can use your favorite web browser. Uh, but if you do use Edge, in the upper right corner there, you can see circled in red right there, uh, is uh, the Microsoft Copilot. And that Microsoft Copilot is powered by OpenAI's GPT-4. And that opens up that right side panel. And now I can ask GPT-4 to read these research papers and summarize them for me and allow me to have a conversation to ask probing questions about the paper. And that ends up being also useful in my own personal healthcare, just as a consumer of healthcare. Uh, this is not my CBC from my last, um, uh, from my last health checkup. Um, actually, my LDL is a little bit elevated, so I need to work on that. Um, uh, but when I receive these, you know, four or five days after uh, my uh, physical exam, it's just a pile of numbers. And I don't really know uh, how to interpret it, uh, and I don't feel good about bothering my primary care physician. Uh, to help me uh, with this. Sometimes there's a letter uh, attached, but typically not. Um, and asking GPT-4 to read these things and again ask questions like, is there something I should need to pay attention to uh, is incredibly empowering as a patient. And maybe the most mysterious thing as a consumer of healthcare is to receive an explanation of benefits form, whatever the heck that is. I, by the way, I was very embarrassed at not knowing how to read an EOB, but then in my interactions with C-suite executives at major health insurance companies, I've learned that they don't have an ability to read these things either. <laughs> um, so again, this is not my EOB. This is an open source one that I've downloaded. But again, it's something where you can just ask GPT-4 to read it and carry out a conversation. And you can see here I've highlighted uh, with the red box that it's able to decode the CPT codes and remind me what this is all about. Uh, tell me if I owe money, and so on. Incredibly empowering. And so, in fact, as we see right now, while there's always some fixation on the clinical decision-making potential of generative AI, and that potential is huge, it also carries risks. And what we are seeing, therefore, is that the early real-world deployments of large language models in healthcare aren't in that clinical decision making, but more in areas pertaining to the administrative burden of healthcare, of note taking, of summarization, uh, and other kind of clerical work. Um, and of course, we are seeing uh, in uh, our uh, activity logs a very rapidly, uh, a rapid rise of use by ordinary patients, turning away from quote unquote Dr. Google. Uh, to actually interacting uh, with a large language model through an application like ChatGPT uh, to get answers uh, that, uh, that they sometimes have a hard time dealing with or get advice on how to navigate an increasingly complicated healthcare system. All right. So now um, uh, here's some text uh, which you might all recognize uh, as um, 
the start of the book Charlotte's Web. Um, I wonder if anyone in the audience sees what's wrong with this. It's beautifully written, and um, it might even bring back some nice memories for you, uh, but it shouldn't because this is totally hallucinate, uh, uh, totally a, what's called a hallucination. And in fact, what you see here um, is the output of GPT-4 when I asked it to hallucinate chapter one of Charlotte's Web. And you see here that GPT-4 really understands the writing style of the author of Charlotte's Web, uh, E.B. White, and understands the story of Charlotte's Web understands what chapter one is about, and is able to write a chapter of text that's in perfect, what's called con latent conceptual alignment with those uh, ideas, with that writing style and, and with the story ideas. And in fact, about a year ago, large language models, early in what's called an alignment process, uh, didn't quote unquote know that they couldn't memorize long texts. And so if, about a year ago, if you would ask say GPT-4 to please recite chapter one of Charlotte's Web, in its eagerness to please you, and by the way, I'm using anthropomorphic language, which is a no-no in computer science, but there's no more efficient way to describe what's going on here. GPT-4 would hallucinate a chapter of text. And the fact that that hallucination didn't just spring up out of thin air, but in fact is in perfect alignment, conceptual alignment with writing styles and ideas, makes it exceptionally convincing and makes it exceptionally dangerous. And so as we move forward, this idea of hallucination uh, is something that is exceptionally important to understand. Um, as the technology has developed, hallucination rates have gone down and the thin line between creativity, because this is undeniably creative, and outright dangerous hallucination uh, is being understood uh, more and more deeply. And this speaks again to a un need to understand in the clinical setting and in the realm of healthcare improvement, uh, this, this idea. Again, it's good to think of GPT-4 as an intern. And in the same way, when you ask an intern to carry out a task and your intern delivers that to you, you have to make an assessment of the veracity and of the quality of the output of your intern. The same thing is true for generative AI. So uh, let's, let's look at this a little bit further. It's not just hallucinations. <clears throat> it's also about doing calculation. And so this is a problem that I really like uh, from my colleague at Harvard Medical School, uh, Zach Kohani, uh, where he asks uh, about a patient for which we are measuring salt intake over a 10-day period, uh, and on those same 10 days, the blood pressure. And then we ask the question, is the rise in blood pressure caused by the rise in salt intake? GPT-4, when given this question, gives a perfect answer, which is, yes, there appears to be a correlation, but correlation doesn't always imply causation, so we don't know. We don't have enough data. And that's a great answer. And so this then raises the natural follow-up question, well, how correlated is the blood pressure with the salt intake? And again, GPT-4 gives a great answer. It says, well, to answer that, we have to calculate what's called the Pearson correlation coefficient. Perfect. And then it gives the Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.88. And unfortunately, that's wrong. And again, you see here that that answer is presented with absolute confidence. It's very convincing. Now, what's going on here? Well, um, at the time that I first encountered this, I decided to walk into the hallway at, in Building 99 in Redmond, uh, which is the headquarters of Microsoft Research, and um, I stopped the first three researchers who were unlucky to walk by <laughs> and stop them. And I asked them to calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient for this uh, set of 10 pairs of numbers. 
And of course, two of them immediately went for their mobile phones and one went to a whiteboard, and I stopped them all. And I said, no, you're not allowed to use any tools. And so they had to do it in their heads, and all three got it wrong. And in fact, interestingly, two of them came to the same wrong 0 0.88 number. And I think if you try to do this yourself, if you forget to square a specific term, you'll get 0 0.88. So again, here we see this eerie uh, kind of analogous limitation, both generative AI systems and in human beings, that without the use of tools, we have significant limitations in being able to do precise calculation like this. And so the obvious answer, of course, is to use tools. If I had let my researchers use a whiteboard or a piece of paper and a pencil or a calculator on a mobile phone, they all would have gotten it right, I'm certain of it. Similarly, if we give GPT-4 the permission to use tools, uh, we also see that it can ground its answers uh, correctly. And so, in fact, today, if you ask GPT-4 the same question, it won't try to calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient in its neural transformer, uh, in its brain. Instead, it will write a piece of code. And uh, it'll show you the code it writes, and then it'll execute that code and read the answer from that. Um, and that ends up being the correct answer of 0 0.97. During the first year of these generative AI systems, there were questions about the safety risks of these AI systems, what they might do, how they might go haywire, how might they might go off the rails. And as a result, they were not given any access to any tools. Uh, but as we have felt more and more confident about their safety and their uh, alignment uh, with human values and instruction following, they've been given more and more permission to use tools like calculators. Uh, like databases, like search engines, like computer programming languages. And so what we're seeing is that it's able uh, increasingly to give you correct answers, just like a human being would uh, when given the use of tools. Uh, another major issue has to do with uh, biases. And GPT-4 and other large language mod models appear to be deeply biased in some um, potentially awful ways. Um, and there is tremendous amount of computer science research going into this. And, then, uh, and in some corners of the computer science research world, there is optimism that these biases can be trained out of these systems. Uh, I'm personally not optimistic about that uh, because these systems are learning from us. And so they reflect the same limitations oftentimes that we have. And in the same way that we have limitations in rote memorization and calculation, we also have limitations in our ability to be perfectly non-biased. And so the question is, uh, what can we do about that? One test uh, that I give to generative AI systems is shown here, this fill in the blank question. Actually, if you ask GPT-4 this question now, it refuses to answer. It realizes that this is a very dangerous question um, and, you know, and, and steps away, basically. Um, but a year ago, uh, it, it was eager to please and would try. And so a year ago, when I asked this question, I got this answer. So not very nice. Now, when you read this answer, you see a couple things. In its neural circuitry, based on the training data that it, it has received, the only best answer it can come up with is president. So there is an intellectual incapability by the generative AI system in the way that it's trained to produce any better answer than that. And that's one reason why GPT-4 actually refuses to give any answer at all today. But notice also that in its answer, GPT-4 is expressing the idea that these are incorrect stereotypes and in fact that they might be harmful. And just like a human being, what we find is that even though we ourselves might exhibit many different kinds of harmful biases, we can also spot harmful biases when we see them. And GPT-4 is proving to be a tireless associate in helping us spot biased decision-making. Uh, and in a study uh, with a medical journal, 
uh, trying to review uh, submitted manuscripts, we found routinely that GPT-4 was able to spot, for example, non-inclusive language and biases exhibited in those submitted manuscripts, biases that escape the attention of the human reviewers. And so while I personally don't believe we can ever stamp out the biases in these generative AI systems, they can and I believe will be powerful tools to help us as healthcare improvement professionals identify, spot, and hopefully mitigate bias decision making uh, by others. Now, I do get lots of questions about, uh, for my healthcare organization, how should I think about adopting this, this technology? Uh, and look, we're all learning. There are many uh, open questions. Um, and I've developed a kind of four-stage roadmap. Um, but there is a zero stage, and I call this stage zero because it's a little bit self-serving. Uh, but the first step, I think, for most healthcare organizations is to not try to develop generative AI technology on your own in-house, but to buy something from a company. And that's self-serving because we are selling uh, uh, stuff like that. Um, but there are other companies as well, and there'll be more and more. And so you could say that stage zero is really about buying generative AI-powered uh, products uh, and services from others. But suppose you want to do something in-house. You want to start an adoption process in-house. Well, the first stage is what I just called the raw use of GPT-4. Uh, and that is just allowing your clinicians, your administrators, your other professionals uh, to just use the generative AI that's in their pockets. Or if you are a subscriber to a major cloud service like Microsoft's Azure, uh, you can access these technologies in a HIPAA-compliant, uh, privacy-preserving way to do things like summarization, to do things like second opinions, and so on. Moving forward, the next stage is to endow GPT-4 with the permission to use some of the tools in your organization. Uh, so if you have some, uh, some ADT tools, if you have other tools to help manage uh, supplies, uh, maybe through part of the ERP, um, uh, other kinds of online healthcare repositories and databases, uh, giving GPT-4 access to the user manuals of those things and an understanding of where and how to execute them uh, will allow a kind of conversational access uh, that avoids every one of the people in your organization having to learn some complex set of parameters or database queries. Moving forward, uh, many healthcare organizations around the world have been investing uh, heavily in aggregating health data in the hopes that they might someday be able to extract insights, maybe through machine learning. Um, many health organizations even have aspirations to somehow create new businesses and uh, new revenue opportunities out of that. Um, but it ends up being extremely difficult because extracting the right subsets of that data, labeling the data, debiasing it, and so on, ends up being extremely difficult um, and labor intensive. Uh, we are finding more and more organizations using GPT-4 to aid that process, and in some cases, automate the process of extracting and preparing data for machine learning. Uh, and then the last stage, which is oftentimes the first thing that enterprise customers ask us for at Microsoft, is to train or specialize or fine tune a GPT model uh, on the specific knowledge and data in your organization. Um, and indeed, that can be very helpful and useful but it's the final stage. Because remember, these large language models don't memorize everything. Uh, they have limitations. And so even if you do a specially trained GPT model, uh, you still need things um, like the tool use uh, in order for it to really have a command uh, of uh, all the information uh, in, your, uh, in your organization. So these four stages are general uh, roadmap, and increasingly, not just Microsoft, but other companies are producing platforms and services and developer tools to help people uh, climb uh, this roadmap. Um, there's oftentimes questions about uh, privacy. Um, and indeed, uh, particularly when you're dealing with protected uh, health information, it's important uh, to operate in a compliant uh, way. 
Um, and um, like all services on Microsoft Azure, the, uh, the Azure OpenAI service uh, maintains privacy uh, in a compliant way, including with HIPAA. Uh, and in particular, there are many more kinds of data that get uh, used when you're doing generative AI, things like prompts, completions, uh, uh, and oftentimes new model improvements through training. And uh, in uh, enterprise cloud environment, uh, those things stay completely private and never leak back uh, to Microsoft or to OpenAI. It's still very early days here. We're all learning. Within Microsoft, our own integrations into all the Microsoft Office applications, into Windows, into Azure, um, uh, into Bing. Uh, we're, we're learning, we're making mistakes, um, but we're trying to codify the good lessons through our experience uh, into our developer tools, but still very early. Uh, but uh, indeed, we do see the world learning very, very quickly here. All right. I'd like to now, uh, in the last two minutes I have here, just to reflect a little bit on you know, what this all means to us as human beings. Uh, because, yes, I get asked questions about how do we adopt this. I get questions about what do we do about hallucinations, about math errors, and so on. But the biggest questions I get aren't that. The two biggest questions are, is this going to steal my job? That's uh, one big one. But the even bigger one is more existential. Uh, and it, it can feel threatening and disturbing to encounter an intelligence like this. And in fact, this is a fierce debate in the computer science world. Uh, the celebrated computational linguist Noam Chomsky, in fact, wrote a remarkably lengthy um, essay for the New York Times uh, entitled The False Promise of ChatGPT. And he and his co-authors uh, wrote extensively through a considerable amount of experimentation with ChatGPT, the conclusion that the deepest flaw is the absence of the most critical capacity of any intelligence to say not only what is the case, what was the case, and what will be the case. That's typically what AI systems have done in the past. But also what is not the case and what could and could not be the case. Those are the ingredients of explanation, the mark of true intelligence. And Chomsky and many other leading thinkers uh, have used this type of argument to say that there is something different here. Well, we decided to ask GPT-4 to read this op-ed. <laughs> and GPT-4 wrote a response, which I show here. And GPT-4's response, I won't read the whole thing, says the following. First, I don't agree. <laughs> it's good for, that it sticks up for itself. They claim, the authors, Noam Chomsky and authors, uh, that G chat GPT is basically high-tech plagiarism and a way of avoiding learning. I think these claims are unfair and misleading. Chat GPT is not intended to replace human learning or intelligence, but to augment it. It's capable of generating original and coherent text, and I think you've seen that in the interactions I've shown you today. As for the examples given by Chomsky, and here the centerpiece example is to ask a system or a human being from many different angles what happens when you let go of an apple. And in a bit of cheekiness, unprompted by us, GPT-4 goes through the entire example and explains from several different points of view the answer to that question. And so now we are left with a conundrum. If you accept Noam Chomsky's argument, and look, deep in my heart, there's a piece of me that does. If you accept that, this response from a computer can't possibly exist. And so now we're in this situation where uh, I refer to this as the nine stages of AI grief. I started off incredibly skeptical when this was first sent to me. And then I got annoyed because I saw more and more of my researchers across Microsoft Research getting duped by this AI stuff. Uh, then I got frustrated because I actually got handed down the edict from my CEO that we are going to go all in on this. 
I got very deep and started to encounter things that I couldn't explain. And that led to a period of joy. In fact, a joy I still feel today. I never thought I would see the day when there would be a technology like this, let alone have my hands on it. And that became a period of intensity to try to help get the world up to speed and try to make this real and usable. And in doing that, a period of chagrin where you start to realize, wow, there's these mysterious things. It gets math wrong. It hallucinates. It has these awful biases. And that leads to concerns. You realize, especially in the healthcare world, that this has serious potential benefits, transformational benefits for all of us, but also serious risks that the whole world of healthcare has to know about. And I won't say that I'm enlightened today, uh, but I have reached a period of acceptance where I believe that there is no stopping this now. And it is up to all of us and all of you to make this great for everyone. And I hope you do that. So thank you all.